Hey, y'all. I'm Andy Alva Irwin, and I'm so excited to be coming to you from my home here in Covington, Georgia, because this is the very spot where I play my guitar and make up stories to tell you. And uh, this is my fireplace. I have to tell you a funny little anecdote about my fireplace. Um, a few weeks ago, yeah, early, yeah, a few weeks ago, I did a, a grown-up show from here online streaming the way you're kind of watching this and uh, grown-ups you know always make comments and one particular grown-up it was a young woman I hope she was young she said wow I love your fireplace it looks so natural I said thank you it is and she said wait a minute how do you make the smoke because she could see smoke you really can't see smoke but she could see smoke inside of it I said well it isn't gas I use a material called wood that's our first vocabulary word, boys and girls. Wood. And I got to brag just a little bit. I, um, I, I cut this wood and split it myself. And I split my wood with an eight-pound maul inside of a tire instead of on a stump. Because, you know, when you have it on a stump, you go, him. And then you got to pick it up, pick it up. But when you cut it in a tire, you go, zoom, and it stays put. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So that's what I do for exercise because I'm too shy to go to the gym. Um, not, um, to what, three days ago. My son and his friends, it's a, a, a young married couple named Allison and Alex, they had brought their 1978 um, Buick Electra station wagon for my son to fix up because that's what they have. It's a beautiful, big, big, big car. And uh, they were working on it. And Alex said, wow, Andy. He was all splitting wood. He said, you're spry. And that's how old I am now. I realize I'm old enough to be called spry and have that be a compliment. Spry. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to uh, talk to you about the holidays. When I was a kid, um, the holidays took forever. And I discovered there are two kinds of grown-ups. There are unwise grown-ups and wise grown-ups. And they both employed a kind of a common phrase that grown-ups like to say to kids. And I was visiting, uh, uh, I was with my mother, rather. I wasn't visiting with my mother. I lived with my mother. But uh, a friend of hers was visiting. Her name is Miss Sally Lynette. And it was April, and it was just getting hot. And I'd been out on my bicycle, and I came in. I was really thirsty, and I got some, some water and uh, a cool pop from the freezer, you know, those little things in plastic sleeve that you suck on. And, and I said, man, I can't wait for school to be out. Man, I just want summer to get here. I can't wait for school to get out. And Miss Sally Lynette said, it'll be out before you know it. That's ridiculous. Things do not happen when you're a kid before you know it. If things happen before you know it, you would sleep late on December 25th. Am I right? Huh? That's ridiculous. And my mama knew it was ridiculous, and she said, oh, me. And then she said, take that cool pop outside, because she knew I was going to make a mess. It's going to turn my mouth blue. And Miss Sally Lynette's the kind of person that if she saw me with a blue mouth, she would think I had a condition. Does they have a blue mouth? I've never seen such a thing. She was one of those ladies. Every time I did something kind of weird, she would say, I've never seen such a thing. And then I wasn't really happy until I could make her say, I've never seen such a thing. But my mama was wise. She didn't say stuff like, it'll be here before you know it. She said the opposite of that. For example, if it was time to go to school, and she was a substitute teacher, so she often drove me to school, and if I wasn't on my bicycle, she'd say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You're as slow as Christmas. That makes sense to me. And, of course, my response had to be, all right, Mama, I'm coming. slow as Christmas because you and I both know Christmas starts earlier and earlier and earlier. If you're a kid in a choir or in the band, you know the holidays start in October because that's when they pass out the music to to do that sort of thing. Or if you're in a, if a dance company, if you're doing like the Nutcracker or something, you start rehearsing that stuff way back in October. And then when Halloween's over, well... Whoa, that's beautiful. 
Suddenly it's Christmas, just after Halloween. Forget about Thanksgiving, it's just a buffet in between. The stores are full of tinsel, they're stocking up the shelves. Santa's in the North Pole, just waking up the elves. Outside it's positively balmy, in the air nary a nip. Suddenly it's Christmas, unbuttoned and unzipped. Dragging through the falling leaves in a one-horse open sleigh. Suddenly it's Christmas, seven weeks before the day. Suddenly it's Christmas, the longest holiday. When they say season's greetings, they mean just what they say. It's a season, it's a marathon retail eternity. And it's not over till it's over and you throw away the tree. No, it's not over till it's over and you throw away the tree. No, it's not over till it's over and you throw away the tree. Thank you. Thank you. I hear the applause pouring through. That's a Loudon Wainwright the third song. Um, so yeah, Christmas takes a long time. And I kind of divide, I divide the holidays into seasons, kind of like even within the season. Like, like, like baseball has a division of seasons. There's pre-All-Star game and post-All-Star game and then getting towards the playoffs where you start looking at it. And then and then there are the division series and the wild card series and all this. So there are little divisions within all, all of that. The holidays work the same way. So you get your pre-holiday when you pass out the music if you're in a, in a chorus or a band or a choir or something like that. And then you get close to when school goes out. And when before school is out, you've got to have your secret Santa. Now, I was a Cub Scout. I loved being a Cub Scout. When I was seven years old, I couldn't wait to become a Cub Scout, mainly because... I wanted the uniform because the uniform just looked beautiful to me. It was back in those days. It was uh, blue with gold piping and buttons on the pockets and the little cap and just really cool. And then you earn rewards, uh, awards, not rewards, <laughs> awards. You win the little um, arrowheads. That's what we had back in those days. And when I got enough arrowheads to go from being a wolf to a bear. My mama was so proud of me. She said, we're going to go to White's department store and get you something for being a bear. This was an extremely cool thing. Now, White's department store in Covington, Georgia, was just down from the Belks. And you know, you know what a Belks is, right? That's right. Belks is where old people buy their clothes. So we went to the White's department store, and we walked in. And my mama said, you can, you know, you can get whatever you want uh, for $5. And I found it. It was a Cub Scout pocket knife. And young people, this is before they had invented safety. They sold pocket knives to eight and a half, nine year olds. Can you believe it? And it really had a long, you know, a long blade, and it had a, a can opener and a bottle opener and a hole punch and a lanyard. You could wear it around your neck. And um, you know, we would we would have these pocket knives. And although I was a Cub Scout, I couldn't wait to become a Boy Scout. The Boy Scouts in their olive drab uniforms with the garrison hat. They were bigger, they were smellier, and they were commercials. They were PSAs, public service announcements, on the television for the Boy Scouts. And they would, and there was a guy named Frankie Ling, Lane, and he was saying, Follow the rugged road, follow the rugged road. Well, the scouts and the recruitment, they were leaving in the morning. Follow the rugged road. And these scouts were camping and they had axes and they were building fires. And it was the coolest thing I ever saw. I wanted to be one of those guys. They were so tough looking. They had brogans and boots and they all looked just like the, they all looked like the Boy Scout that was on the cover of the Boy Scout manual, which was illustrated by Norman Rockwell, a very famous illustrator, very famous painter. And that guy was walking and he had in his hand a Boy Scout manual. And then that Boy Scout manual had a picture of a Boy Scout who was walking, who had in his hand a Boy Scout manual with a picture of a Boy Scout who had another manual with a picture of the Boy Scout. Wow, infinite regression. It's kind of like the Cracker Jack box. You know, you got the little sailor with the box. He's got a picture of the box with a little sailor on the box. He's got a picture on the box with a little sailor. I don't have time to go into the infinity of it all, but man, I couldn't wait. And finally, I became a Boy Scout. And right before school was, was out, that first holiday season, right before 
we had Secret Santa. Now, you know how Secret Santa works if you're in some sort of club or organization and stuff. Secret Santa works like this. I'm getting hot. Secret Santa is um, everybody puts their name on a slip of paper and you put it in a hat. It's always got to be a hat, you know, and, uh, and then everybody draws out a name and then you can spend money on your Secret Santa recipient. And the, the spending limit, I think, when I was a kid was $3 for Secret Santa. And, of course, you went to White's department store to look for official equipment. White's department store was just that. It was a department store. It was a clothing store. And, um, but one corner was the Boy Scout corner, man. And it had a Pee Wee Harris, who was this comic strip character from Boy's Life magazine, in his scout uniform, and he had his thumb up. And you could tell the marketing was done by people two generations ahead of us because he said, if it's official, it's tops. And, yeah, that was out of out of style even when I was a kid, y'all. So I went through. I was looking for Boy Scout equipment because I'm a Boy Scout now. I don't want the little blue Cub Scout stuff. There was the Boy Scout pocket knife, which was just like the Cub Scout pocket knife. And I really wanted one, but my mama said, you already have a knife. But it was embarrassing because it was a Cub Scout pocket knife and not a Boy Scout pocket knife. It was the exact same knife except the little color of it and the badge. But I'm getting something for my Secret Santa recipient, and I found it. And it was called the Boy Scout Snake Bite Kit. Ask your grandfather or grandfather parent or great uncle or some older gentleman in your life if you think I'm making this up. These really existed. And this is what it was. It was about the size of a half a hot dog weenie. And it, and it screwed into each other and you unscrewed it. And inside was an X-Acto knife. And they call that a scalpel. A little swab of alcohol and a little wrapper and a little string for a tourniquet. And so what you wanted to happen with your snake bite kit, you wanted to be out with the other Boy Scouts, and you wanted a friend of yours to get bit <laughs> by, by a copperhead or something. You go, hey, man, you've been bit. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, don't worry. I got the official Boy Scout snake bite kit. And you unscrew it, and then you take the swab, and then you're supposed to take the X-Acto knife. There are always two fang marks, right? And you take the X-Acto knife, and you cut an, an X, and to each of the bite wounds, and then you take the little, uh, you swab that to, to uh, you know, to sterilize it, and then you take the little hot dog pieces and you use that to suck out the venom. <laughs> hey man, should we be getting to a hospital? No, I got it, we're good. <laughs> the official Boy Scout snake bite kit. Coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. And it was $1.75. And we had a $3 limit, so I'm gonna make a dollar and a quarter profit. I was, it was so cool. My mama was looking at scarves. She was always looking at scarves because she sent scarves to people who had given her something as a thank you gift, and scarves always fit. And she has a lot of scarves, and I'm sure that they re-gifted scarves back and forth. She's looking through scarves. I said, Mama, check it out. I found my gift. And she opened it up. She looked at it. She unscrewed it and said, What the cuss? And she screwed it back on together, and she walked out the door. Now, she walked out the door with the snake bite kit. She didn't pay for the snake bite kit. She just walked out the door, and she just marched. Remember marched? Does your mom march? She marched. And I went out the door with her. There was no alarm going, <laughs> there's nothing like that. No, no, no. And just one of the ladies goes, Miss Tootsie. That was my mama's name, Miss Tootsie. Don't make fun. Miss Tootsie. And my mama got on the street. And on the street, on the sidewalk, and she marched all the way to the old Bank of Covington building, which was replaced by the Main Street Bank building, which was replaced by the BB&T, which is replaced by the Truist Bank. Truist. If any grown-ups are, are watching, Truist begs the question, can truth be quantified? Okay, I digress. She marched upstairs. Now, upstairs at that bank building, there was a dentist, who was my uncle, there was a lawyer, whom I didn't know, and there was Dr. Roscoe Sams, one of the first doctors that ever existed. He was an old man my entire life. He was an old doctor. He was so old that he used glass syringes. He was so old that his nurse had the little hat. He was so old that he had a, a jar of leeches next to the examining table. And he, he she, she walked right past his nurse receptionist, Miss Miss Amy, and and she said, "Hi, Amy." And she said, "Do you need to say Dr. Sams?" And she just marched right into his office. Dr. Sams was reading the Atlanta Journal paper, and he put the paper down and said, "Well, hello, Tootsie. What's going on?" 
He was one of these old guys that had really bushy, bushy, bushy eyebrows. And if he raised his eyes, he opened up his eyes, he would knock his glasses off down to his nose. Boom. What's going on, Tusi? Boom. And his glasses came down. She said, Dr. Roscoe. She had to call him Dr. Roscoe. He was a generation ahead of her, and she called him by his first name. Like some kids call me Mr. Andy. But you guys can call me Andy, but that's not what I'm here to tell you about. Dr. Roscoe, look what they're selling, boys, at the White's department store. He looked at it. It was about the size of a half a hot dog weenie, but the Boy Scout logo was embossed on the side of it. He said, huh. He opened it up, looked at it, took out the little X-Acto knife scalpel, saw the alcohol swab, saw a little string for the tourniquet, and he went to his telephone that he had been renting since 1932. He picked it up. When I was a kid, since you know how old I am, since I'm spry, you only had to dial five numbers if it was a local number in Covington. Like, all our numbers were 786, but you didn't even have to dial the 78. So on that phone, like all the other old people's phones, they had a metal dial, not a plastic one, like the newer ones that we had at our house. And the six was worn off because it was always the first number of people dialed. He punched his finger. This was in the before time. When the telephone was tied to the wall. And you didn't know who was calling you until you picked it up. In the before time. Dr. Stans looked up at me. Andy, watch department stores as slow as Christmas. Watch department store. Uh, get me E.G. Lassiter, please. E.G. Lassiter was the owner and manager of White's department store. E.G. Lassiter. E.G. Lassiter, Roscoe Sams. Uh, y'all are selling these little hot dog looking things to children at your store to the Boy Scouts. Discontinue these now. They're ridiculous and dangerous. Bye. Bam. Back in those days, y'all, there was something called doctor's orders. And doctors could order you to do stuff that they thought it was good for you. That was it. So, what Mr. Lassiter did is he discontinued ordering the snake bite kits, but he still had a lot of them in his stock. So they went from being a dollar and a quarter. Is that what I said? I can't remember now. Dollar seventy-five. That's what I said. They went from being that to forty-five cents. He put them on sale. Therefore, when Secret Santa time came, and everybody got their gift, every single kid, everybody in my Boy Scout troop got a snake bite kit, except for Pat Wiggins. He got the little cutlery kit that hangs on your belt with a little knife, fork, and spoon that fold up because I was his secret Santa. End of story. Thank you very much. Now, I have an Aunt Marguerite who's 85 years old and only recently graduated from medical school. She has been a widow a very, 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 very long time. And she has this friend who's an old man who's also been a widow for a very, 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 very long time. And his name is Mr. Ike. And we were all visiting together not long ago. I was a grown-up at this time, but my kid was was young. And, ah, I have water in a sucky bottle. I had one in a cup that looked more presentable to you, but I can't find it. In my bicycle sucky bottle. It's just like a sippy cup to a toddler, really, if you think about it. You know, it's just, it's just a grown-up sippy bottle. I mean, well, this is a bicycle's athletic bottle. It's not a sippy cup like a child. Don't insult me that way. And my Aunt Marguerite said, I, I've always wanted to go on a sleigh ride. Well, this is last year. Last September, he, uh, he went to New York State, where he has a, a friend uh, in the upper part of New York State. Uh, up 
close to Buffalo. Way, way up north. Far, far away. And he has a distant cousin that he loves to visit. And um, they had been in the army together for a while. And, and they enjoyed each other's company. And this guy owned a ski lodge. And he, uh, he, he went into the ski lodge. And the ski lodge had a sleigh and would pick up people from the train station back in the day and, and ride them to the ski lodge. And then after a while, the train stopped running, but then the, the sleigh still ran, and he would take dragging people around in the sleigh. That was part of being at the ski lodge. Well, after a while, there wasn't enough hard, crusty um, ice on the road. Uh, sleighs require snow, but also require some ice. There wasn't enough snow on the roads and the trails, and they had, you know, snowmobiles kind of came into vogue, and and people didn't really want the sleigh anymore. This is big sleigh. This is not a one horse open sleigh. This is a this is a big old thing. This is a uh, eight person sleigh that requires two horses. And my 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 uh, uh, Mr. Ike went to see his cousin up there, and and the sleigh was inside the ski lodge like a decoration that was covered with Christmas stuff. And Ike said. What do you do on the sleigh in here? Why aren't you using it? And the guy said, well, you know, we're not really using it anymore because there isn't enough hard ice to pull it and more people are snowboarding, uh, snowmobiling. But some of the older customers see it and they get mad. They don't like to see it in here because they used to ride in it. And I said, you ought to sell it. And the guy said, who am I going to sell this to? And I said, I'll buy it. The guy said, I'm not going to sell it to you. You can have it. So... I got a y'all haul trailer, you know, a, a car flat one, a flat flatbed y'all haul trailer, and he brought it, he brought it here to Covington, Georgia. And my son likes to dink with cars. The same guy worked with the station wagon, station wagon. As I said, station wagon is proof that they didn't invent safety until not so long ago because that station wagon, it's an, it's a seven passenger sa station wagon, has no cup holders. It only has two shoulder belts for mom and dad because the kids are expendable. But there are ashtrays next to every seat, including the way back seat that could not accommodate anybody bigger than 12 years old. But that's not what I came here to tell you. I came and he, and he brought that sleigh back and he brought it up to my house where my kid has a car shop in the backyard. Yes, I'm that guy. And, uh, you know, now he's got a sleigh in Georgia. What's he going to do? Well, they went and got a, a Ford Ranger. And they, they went to pull apart and uh, just bought the chassis of the Ford Ranger and mounted the sleigh on on the Ranger and then uh, the Ranger chassis. So it's a four-wheel sleigh. And then Ike has an organic farm where he sells Christmas trees. It's a beautiful place. Kids love going to Ike's farm. What Ike does is he sells Christmas trees, but anybody, whether they're buying trees or not, can go out to his farm and he'll take them on sleigh rides. He has two old mules out at his organic farm named Hope and Crosby. And the kids pile in and they sing, Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Well, every kid in the world worth their salt makes up new lyrics to Jingle Bells. I mean, because Jingle Bells has been done to death, right? I mean, Jingle Bells, Bing Crosby, Andrew Sisters, James Taylor, everybody does James, J Jingle Bells. James Taylor's is more like a... a 12 bar blues kind of jingle bells because it's been done it's been done so kids will sing jingle bells jingle bells jingle all the way oh what fun it is to ride in a two mule four wheel sleigh hey mr ike broke his bike he has to ride a mule he drags us round through the town because we are his fools and then he was like get on my sleigh and go get me some tinder and kindling now what they'll do after it gets dark and he puts the mules away he always has a couple of teenagers who are helping him with his mules He'll gather the kids around, and they have a great big fire, and they have s'mores, and he always tells them poetry. He forces them to listen to poetry. But before they do that, the kids will build the fire. And when he comes to the fire, they've, taken, they've collected tinder and kindling. Now, tinder is the little bitty sticks, and kindling are the bigger sticks, and fuel are the big logs. There are three parts to a fire that you build, like a campfire or a fire like this. Tinder, kindling, and fuel. And the teenage kids help the young kids build it. And he always has some fat lighter under the fire. And then he comes out and he unwraps a leather 
It's just a leather sheet. And inside the sheet is a bow, very much like this. Ah! It's a bow like this. And he twists a stick in the bow. And he takes a piece of soapstone and he puts it over the stick um, like that. And the stick goes into a piece of pine. And he goes, <laughs> and then smoke rises from that. And after the smoke rises from that, he will take the little spark that's inside of that little hole on that little piece of pine, and he will pour that spark on some red cedar bark, which is just like the cedar trees all over here, right? And he'll go, and a little flame pops up, and he lowers that flame to the piece of fat lighter, and when that fat lighter lights, the fire comes to life, and the kids go, whoa. He has just made fire with a bow and a stick. It's amazing. And then one particular night, all the kids are gathered. There's always that one kid. There's always that one kid who's very, very smart. There's always that one kid that all the other kids don't relate to quite as well. There's always that one kid that spends a lot of time at the library. And that kid is always drawn to Mr. Ike. And then the kids will all be talking and they'll sing and there'll be some teenager with a guitar and they'll sing some more and they'll make up funny songs. And then Ike will say, poetry time. And the kids all know to get really quiet. And Ike will say, look up at the sky this one particular time. I was there. Look up at the sky. And all the kids looked up at the sky. And I said, pick your favorite star. And that one kid, man, that one kid was next to Ike. His name was Chaz. Chaz, how can I have a, a favorite star? I don't know. You can have a favorite star. It doesn't make sense to have a favorite star. Well, yeah, it does. It's fine. You can have a favorite star. I got favorite stars. Sometimes they change. I don't understand. There's nothing to understand. Just pick a star you like. And what do I do? Then you talk to it. How can you talk to a star? You can talk to a star. You can make a wish. I don't believe in making a wish on a star. Oh, that's too bad. You don't believe in magic? Of course not. Oh, that's too bad, too. Well, just look at a star. And the kid looked up. And one star at that moment did a twinkle. And the kid said, I see it twinkling, but I know that's just an atmospheric illusion. Good for you, Ike said to that kid. Now look at that star. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it. I think it's just beyond Orion's belt. He knew his constellations. I told him, that's good to know, to know your constellations. Now let's talk to the star. And Ike said, Oh, star, the fairest one in sight, we grant your loftiness the right to some obscurity of cloud. It will not do to say of night, since dark is what brings out your light. Some mystery becomes the proud, but to be taciturn in your resolve is not allowed. Say something to us. We can learn by heart, and when alone, repeat. Say something. And it says, I burn. But say with what degree of heat. Talk Fahrenheit, talk centigrade, use language we can comprehend. Gives us very little aid but does say something in the end, and steadfast as Keats' Eremite, not even sinking from its fear. It asks a little of us here. It asks of us a certain height. So, children, when at times the mob is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we can choose something like a star to stay our minds on and be stayed. 
Now, I knew he was talking to a bunch of little kids around the fire, but they were all silent, all of them quiet. He also knew that most of them really didn't know what he was saying, but they liked the way he said it. And they liked that he knew, that they knew, that they knew that he knew, that he had respect for them. He had so much respect for the kids that when Chaz said to Ike, the beef stayed, that doesn't make sense. That little boy was bold enough to talk back to that old man, and Ike was about 85. And that old man was wise enough to allow that kid to talk back if he entered a conversation. So he said, what do you mean? Oh, be stayed. That doesn't make sense. Stay. Stay. To be stay. To be stayed. It's like stayed is the past tense of stay. If I stay in my room, I don't be stayed in my room. I'm staying in my room. Or I stayed in my room, but I don't be stayed. No, that's not the same kind of stayed. Stayed means you calm down yourself. And you breathe. And you turn out all the noise. And you turn off all your computers. And you don't look at your phone. And you just look at a star. And breathe. And relax. That's what be stayed means. Chaz said, oh, oh, to be stayed. Okay. And Chaz looked up at that star and said, I think I'm being stayed. I love you, Mr. Ike. I love you, Mr. Chaz. This song that I'm about to do for you has nothing to do with the holidays or Christmas or winter or anything. It could take place in winter. It is, uh, but it's literary. It's literary, and since this is a library gig, I should do something literary. Don't you agree? I knew you would. Um, I will go ahead and give you a little bit of preliminary information. This is from Homer's Odyssey. Homer's Odyssey is an epic poem. It, ancient poem and it's epic. Epic is one of the vocabulary words. Epic means too long. It's just too long. That's what epic means. And, um, uh, Odysseus is uh, the person who is singing it. He is the uh, protagonist and um, the antagonist is the Cyclops and he's a big one-eyed monster. He's not like a cute little one-eyed monster like Mikey from Monsters Inc. No, he's a big one-eyed giant kind of cat. And um, this is from the perspective of Odysseus, who was traveling from uh, Troy to Ithaca. He was leaving the battles of Troy, Alabama, on his way to Ithaca, New York. Yeah. I am just a rambling boy, Ithaca bound. Making my way there from Troy. Here's an adventure that I found. Is the... Cyclops winking or blinking That eyeball in his head I listen for sounds of serenity With every word that he has said I notice his squint, his mouth smirky slant Can I see a friendly glance? No, I can't And his complimentary mints are covered with ants Is a Cyclops winking or blinking? Oh, is a Cyclops winking or blinking? How can I read his mood? I wonder what he is thinking. I'm thinking he thinks of me as food. Compared to this giant, I'm a little shrimp. He's putting mascara on his one eye to primp. How can you tell if a snake has a limp? And is Cyclops winking or blinking? Oh, is a Cyclops winking or blinking? I just want to leave this cave. And from the way this cavern is stinking, I can tell polyphemus don't never bathe. I'm wondering how this drama ends. This giant ain't getting no help from his friends, but he only pays half for his contact lens. Is a cyclops winking or blinking? Is 
this is the end of the instrumental verse. It's not really an instrument, but it could be worse. If I don't move on, the librarians will curse a cyclops singing or blinking. Oh, is the cyclops winking or blinking? All alone, he feels bereft. And I saw him try to swat that fly. It's clear he cannot perceive depth. So I stabbed him in the eye. Yes, I know. Ew, sometimes you gotta try when there's nothing else to do. Now I've gotta ride out underneath this you. All right, let me explain this a bit. Uh, this is from, as I said, Odysseus. And the, the Cyclops' name is Polyphemus. Polyphemus. Polyphemus obviously means many Femuses. Femuses. Or I guess the plural will be Femi. Femi. Anyway, he's the first character in all of literature to say, duh. And, you know, he's concerned about his diet, so he likes to know who he's eating. And so when Odysseus is coming in, saying he smells something cooking in the cave, he says, what's cooking in the cave? It smells really good. Well, he finds out it's not just what's cooking, it's who's cooking, because Polyphemus is cooking his friends. I know this is kind of gnarly. And he goes, yeah. And, and then he, you know, Polyphemus looks at Odysseus and says, what is your name? And Odysseus is wise to him. He goes, nobody. What is your name? Nobody. What is your name? Nobody. And then Odysseus has been carved on a stick and then he pokes him in the eye. And he goes, ah! that's what Polyphemus said. Ah, yeah. Nobody has stabbed me in the eye. Nobody has stabbed me in the eye. And the other giants in the neighborhood are going, nobody stabbed Polyphemus in the eye. Nobody stabbed Polyphemus in the eye. So I guess Polyphemus ain't been stabbed in the eye. <laughs> And then, so uh, Odysseus, uh, you know, Polyphemus is so ignorant. He's so ignorant that he ends sentences with a preposition. So he's going, where are you at? Where are you at? But he has a bunch of sheep in there, and uh, Odysseus is hiding under one of the sheep, and the sheep are calling out of the cave. And he, he, now he's got to crawl out underneath this you because you is a sheep, a female sheep. That's really funny in front of a live audience. It just, it really works. He's no longer winking or blinking. Oh, he's no longer winking or blinking. Thunderous applause. I can hear it. I can't. I'm going to do one more song, and um, this is also about how long the holidays are, but it's kind of positive. I made this up about five years ago. I like it when we wake up on Thanksgiving, have coffee and watch the parade. There's frost on the pumpkin in these dwindling daylight days. When the last balloon is over, the children ask about Santa Claus. How a man and his reindeer defy known physical laws. And I like Christmas, can't make me not. Oh, this busy world keeps trying, but it might as well all stop. I like Christmas, hope you do too. And if you feel a little spirit from the song, when you hear it, it's the least that I can do for Christmas. I like it when the catalogs stop coming and the cards begin to arrive. Old friends we haven't seen in years, let us know they're still alive. We get to reminiscing about the folks no longer here. We tell the same sweet stories year after year after year. And I like Christmas, can't make me not. Oh, this busy world keeps trying, but it might as well stop. I like Christmas, hope you do too. And if you feel a little spirit from the song, when you hear it, it's the least that I can do for Christmas. We go to hear the children sing, we go to watch them dance. We believe in Drosselmeyer's magic for a while. We put Bing on the phonograph for 1940s romance. Though 
Those Andrews sisters always make me smile I like it when we gather for the dinner with close and distant folk. Last year we had tofurkey, a culinary practical joke. Obligatory sleigh bells I use for percussion on this song. Tell you that this is a seasonal jingle, you're encouraged to sing along. And I like Christmas. I like Christmas. Can't make me not. Can't make me not. All this busy world keeps trying. All this busy world keeps trying. But it might as well stop. But it might as well all stop. I like Christmas. Hope you do too. And if you feel a little spirit from the song when you hear it, it's the least that I can do for Christmas. For Christmas. For Christmas. Obviously, I did not have a band to do the percussion while I kept playing, but you endured that, and I'm grateful to you. Thank you so much. I hope you have the greatest holiday you can possibly have. I know we all can't be together, but we have the Zoom, and we have um, computers, and other ways that we can be in touch because you're watching this, so you have one of those devices around. And, um, you know, it's going to be over soon. And when you get old, you're going to be one of those old people that says, in 2020, that's what we had to endure. And your grandkids are going to run from you. Oh, no, he's talking about the COVID again. Wah! So, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Bless you. Bye, y'all.